Welcome to the Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. The Foundation has set up a COVID relief fund in order to support thousands of union performers who are going through tough times. Since March of 2020, thanks to your donations, the Foundation has given nearly $7 million in emergency aid to more than 7,000 performers and their families. If you are a sag after member and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guests. Please welcome F. Murray Abraham. Thank you so Hi. much for being here. Pleasure. Uh, this is an audience of your fellow SAG after actors. So I actually always like to start at the beginning by asking, how did you get your SAG card? I, um, I was, uh, I became an extra here in New York City, but I got my equity card in LA. And when I came here, it was easy because we were, a, you know, a member of the other union to become a member of the, uh, of the sister union in those days. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it costs these days, but uh, I could just barely afford it in those days. I hear that a lot, that like the money you get from your first job, a lot of it has to go towards the SAG fees. But yes, my, yes, <laughs> I was, I mean, first of all, I'm a, I'm a very serious union man. Okay. Let's get great. that straight up front. Great. <laughs> I was actually kind of hoping you would say it was from the Fruit of the Loom commercials. <laughs> <laughs> you infamously were the grape, I believe. No, it was the leaf, man. The leaf, the leaf. I'm so the grape, man. <laughs> leaf, baby. It was fun. It was fun. You're making commercials in those days was, was actually was a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. it, paid, it paid up. It allowed my wife to quit working. I, I made a lot of commercials. Um, and I know, I, I believe you grew up in Texas, which is obviously far from the industry. What yes. sort of piqued your interest in acting? Well, I, I grew up on the border of Mexico. I, I, I used to think I was, I still have a Mexican soul. Uh, I speak Spanish. I'm, uh, I love the culture, but uh, I had no idea about the theater. I was kind of a small town, small time hoodlum. Really, I was, I was going nowhere. And uh, juvenile delinquent is what I was. And uh, when I was 16, a, a teacher said to try this. I don't know what she saw in me because I had no literary interests or background at all. My people are all blue collar, hardworking people, coal miners, steel workers. And uh, I stepped on the stage and I knew exactly where I belonged. And from that, I won a contest in Texas. I became, uh, I got a scholarship to go to school. Wouldn't have been able to otherwise. It was a hundred dollars scholarship to go to college. Wow. Yeah, the University of Texas at El Paso. And then after that, uh, about a year of that, I, um, I thumbed my way to LA and uh, started looking for my, my life. Do you remember that first play you did in school? Oh. <laughs> Oh, and, oh, sure. The first reading was, was Shakespeare. The first time I studied was uh, Julius Caesar. But the first play, the play I won was The Old Lady Shows Her Medals, a wonderful one-act play. I know that play. I, or, I, I don't think I've seen it, but I feel like I've seen people do scenes from it. Yeah, it's a winner. It's yeah. Terrific. So um, how did you end up studying under Uta Hagen at the HP studio in New York City? I, I'm going to guess that was a huge turning point. Yeah, well, after the play, uh, when I got my equity card in L.A. with uh, the wonderful ice cream suit, I did it with, uh, with Ray Bradbury. It was his play. And he remained a friend for all, his whole life. He was a very good guy. Anyway, uh, we ran for about eight or nine months, which is a long time in L.A. It's a long time anywhere. And uh, I decided in that period... I didn't like the way actors thought of themselves in, in L.A. Mm. I didn't like the one-dimensional aspect. They, I, I'm, I'm not saying they're one-dimensional actors, but if they do the same thing over and over again, if they sell that thing that they do, they become that thing. I saw it happening, and I was told that's what I should do, that I should make a trademark of some kind and sell that because the competition was so fierce. And I... I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a, a great actor. And I didn't think that was the way to do it. So 
as soon as the play closed, my wife and I, with whom I've been together for almost 60 years now, by the way, um, my wife and I pulled up stakes and went to New York to study. And I auditioned for Miss Hagen and she remained my only teacher. What you were saying about actors in Los Angeles, I wish I could tell you which changed, but that sounds very similar to uh, <laughs> a lot of actors today. So I'm glad you beat a path to New York. Um, I mean, working with Uta Hagen, like, I don't know if at that time she was as revered and, you know, iconic as she is now, but I have to imagine for you, like, that was, that must've been huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was wonderful. Uh, a hell of an audition. Uh, it was very important to me. And uh, yeah, it was huge. It was a big step because it did started to, reassert my confidence in myself and my in my instincts, which is what I really rely on as an actor. I'm a, I'm a very technical actor, but I'm, I trust my instinct first and foremost. I'm curious what sort of career you were imagining for yourself. Was theater your first love or did you always yeah. want to do film and TV? No, because, because I discovered myself in the theater in, in high school and then in college. But uh, I, I really like the I like being on stage a lot. For one thing, there are no filters between you and the work, mm -hmm. you know. And that's a great discovery in movies and in television. The idea that you really do have a second shot, and those experts can make you look a lot better and make you look acceptable. Because sometimes it ain't working, you know, and it stinks. And if you're on stage and it stinks, there's nothing you can do. You you don't like to admit it, but you know when you're no good. <laughs> and it's just awful. But, uh, you know, you go, you plow through, and the next day you, you improve. You, you have eight shots a week. I like that a lot. It gives you a chance to refine the work. That really is one of the reasons that in, I don't want to damn these actors who only do television or only do the same kind of character each time. I, I don't want to diss that at all because you got to make a living. And in our business, in television particularly, there's a real crunch, a time crunch, because it's so expensive. And you're hired to deliver the goods now. We have a certain amount of time. We've got a certain amount of stuff we've got to do. And we'll take right now whatever you can deliver, but we can't give you any more time to play with it. I understand that. So you begin to hone your craft and your talent to be able to deliver a certain thing that you know they're looking for and they rely on you for, and most important, that they hire you for. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at some of the great old early movies, the great character actors that you see surfacing time and again, you know what they're gonna deliver before you hear them, you see them, you know what they're gonna do. And at the same time, they do it so well, it's perfectly acceptable. And you want them to do that. That's what you expect of them. But that doesn't mean I have to do that. I, I, I just, uh, I, I'd rather not. I'd rather do King Lear from time to time. I, I do. I, it doesn't mean I'm a superior actor or a superior person. It's just the way I feel. No, I mean, obviously, you, you've done TV. You're doing it now with Mythic Quest. Yeah, it's a great show. <laughs> great show. I, I'm curious, though, growing up, were there actors whose career paths you wanted to emulate or you sort of looked up to? I know it must have been unusual at the time being you, your, your mother is Italian. I believe your father was a Syrian immigrant. I don't know if you had people who looked like you or, you know, that. that <laughs> you <point> to. No, <laughs> I suppose people like, um, oh, gosh. When I heard myself, when I decided I was, I was an actor, I, you know, just born to be an actor, I started to listen to myself on tape recordings, an old tape recorder. My father was one of the, he, was, he had one. Anyhow, the point is, I listened to myself and I realized that I wasn't sounding like some of the announcers on television and radio. I wasn't sounding like some of the people. I was sounding like someone from the border of Mexico. I had an accent. So I began to study the uh, recordings of, uh, of the British actors. We, we all make that mistake, but uh, <laughs> I thought that was the way to speak if you wanted to speak properly. And I really worshiped Olivier. I loved the way Gilgood talked and uh, Sir Ralph Richardson too. I still love him a lot, but 
and, and, and I really studied and I broke out of that accent. And, uh, and then when Marlon Brando came along, everything else stopped. He, wow. he really changed my life. Did you ever get to work with Brando? I'm racking my brain. I know. Oh, okay. No, I didn't. Damn it. I didn't. I don't know if I could have been able to. I, I, I held him in such awe. No, I'm sure I could have. Yeah. I'm sure he was a good man. When, when, uh, his, uh, when his stuff was auctioned at Sotheby's here in New York, I bought a bunch of his stuff. Really? Yeah, his son, Christian, at the time, God rest his soul, invited me to sit with him. And I was bidding on his father's goods, uh, the stuff I could afford. Some of the stuff was just too expensive. I tried to buy the Godfather's script, but when it started to go for 200000 I said, no, I can't do that. But I did buy lamps and things and tchotchkes and furniture. I've got a kind of a Brando room. Down. I really liked him a lot, not only for his work, but the way he lived his life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, like Uta Hagen, you can't get better than that. No, <laughs> I, she worked with him. That's right. Of course. Yeah. Did you ever ask her about working with him? Oh, yeah, of course. She tells us, you got time for a story? Quick story? Of course. So she was doing, uh, she was doing um, the, the Tennessee Williams. She was doing, uh, oh, shame on me, a uh, streetcar named Desire. But when she came into the show, um, she was replacing and Brando was taking off for a vacation. And when it came time for him to come back into the show, he didn't show up for the rehearsal. Mm. He showed up for the performance without ever having rehearsed with her. Wow. She, but she, as far as she's concerned, she's ready. Let's, well, I, I know the role. You know your role. Let's just do it. Let's get it on. And they did. It was sensational. Wow. God, just uh, trying to imagine what it would have been like to see that. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> So, so I, admire a lot of, I have, I, I admire a lot of actors, mostly Americans, frankly. Really? Oh yeah. 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 We don't get enough uh, credit for what we've done. I think Brando changed the course of acting uh, both among the Brits. Uh, they'll, they'll tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was, it was monumental, but uh, not only that, it's just that I think we do Shakespeare better than the Brits, frankly. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> I feel very strongly about that. We, we, we're fresher. We, we bring something quite refreshing and new to it. The Brits, as much as I like them and have many good friends and work with them and, and like, like admire many of them, I think sometimes they take it for granted that they have a lock on it. And once you feel that way about your work, it gets pretty dull. If you start feeling that way about yourself, I think you're dead. I think you're finished. I agree with you because I think we're a little less precious about it, if that makes sense. And by the way, I've been fortunate enough to see you in Shakespeare. I got to see Merchant of Venice, uh, gosh, many years ago, it feels like. Oh, at the Broad. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Boy, I love that performance. I was, that was one of my favorite performances. Real, it's a great production. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it seems like when you started out, it, at least, you know, from history's perspective, you seem to work right out of the gate and really in some impressive projects. You were in Serpico, All the President's Men, working on and off Broadway and everything from the Ritz to Uncle Vanya. Um, did you find that you were consistently working? Because that's what it feels like just looking at the resume, but I know it probably feels very differently for you. It was different. <laughs> You're talking about a long career. So, I mean, you <laughs> no, there were long dry spots. You know, it's the same as everyone goes through. It's awfully hard. That's why it's so important that we support each other when, when we have the money. We really have to contribute to our, to our union for what they're doing. I, I really am strongly believe in that. Share what you got. Yeah, I, there were long periods of time. And uh, it's very painful, all those doubts. But, you know, when you do that, when you have those long dry spells, and I was, I've been very lucky. But when you do have them, you really have to continue studying. That's hard to convince anyone. Mm -hmm. but you really have to work out every day. You got to do your physical stuff. You got to do your vocal stuff. And you got to read. You got to keep the memory going. I work on sonnets. I memorize stuff even when I'm not doing a play. I, it's important. And I like it. I enjoy it. I think there was actually a point where you sort of stepped away from acting in, in the late 70s. Is that accurate to say? No, I think acting may have stepped away from me. 
So I, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine not not thinking about being an actor. Mm -hmm. I taught for a while, but because it was a, such a pleasure. But it was once a week, and uh, I was always looking. And aside from all that, uh, I had a bad thing with. Uh, I'm not going to blame anyone for this. But there are sometimes when we can become ourselves a little too precious about our so-called talent and gifts. And you begin to think because you've won a few awards, you want to become, become very selective about certain things. Well, it's good to be selective, but you have to keep working. You gotta, you gotta. I'm not telling you should do crap, but don't turn down everything just because it's not perfectly right. That's a, I think people do that from time to time. But I think the only way to really prove, prove that to yourself that you have the talent that you think you do is just to get out and work. And in New York, there are so many venues, at least there were before the stupid pandemic. There's so much theater. I, I've done street theater, children's theater, and I'll do it again. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were, you were actually right before the pandemic getting ready to do something here in L.A.? Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was going to be out here. We were going to do it in L.A. eventually. But it was a terrific piece. We we're just about to open. And we're going to do it again early next year. Good, good. It's a terrific. It's really so good. I can't wait to do it. Is this the Ethan Cohen script? No, unfortunately. God, I love doing his stuff. We really communicate. No, that's uh, the, uh, it's, uh, it's a play based on a conversation between Norman Mailer and his son, Buffalo. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really, really good. It's all Norman's actual words. We don't invent anything for him. And one of the things he says in 2004 is when the conversation took place. He says, you can't stop a man who's never embarrassed by himself. That's what he said in 2004. That's the kind of prescience the man had. Anyway. Uh, so I guess it's fair to say it's been a long time since you auditioned for anything. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, going back to those early days, how were you at auditioning? I was, uh, I, I have to, I hate to say, it, I, I like to teach. Mm. I gather a class together perhaps once a year, maybe once every year and a half. And I go over to the Atlantic Theater Company mm. and they gather a, a pretty big class and we do scene work together because I, I, I enjoy it and I'm good at it. Uh, but uh, I, I also get a lot back. From the, from the class, I get their energy back again and their ambition. And I need that zits every once in a while. I do, as much as dedicated as I am, I have to be reminded. I don't wanna to get too complacent because I am successful and I, I have some money in the bank and I have, a, I have a good life, but you can get a little fat up here if, you don't, if you're not careful. And you listen to these people and they confront you. These students are smart. Really? Anyway, I tell them they have to be careful not to get resentful because I've met a lot of actors who do that because they're not doing the work that they think they should be doing or they're not, they're not getting the respect that they think they deserve. And they do deserve it, uh, if you can use a word like deserve. But what happens is they begin to resent it and be angry. And you carry that into an audition. And I, be, I know that early on I was doing that. I was caring. You, you, they smell that. They know that. They're not stupid. What, you're, you're upset about auditioning? Pacino told me that he, he enjoyed auditioning because he looked on it as though it was a chance to, to try to act, to, 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 to rehearse, to do his chops. I found it difficult. And, and it, that comes through. You know, they know us better than we know them. They see 200 of us when we see one of them. That's... You, you got to swallow that crap. You, you, you know, what they want to do is see what you have to offer. There's only one, the only reason they're seeing you, unless they simply have to because the union said so, is because they don't have what they want. They're looking for something. Maybe they have an idea, but they're not positive. What you have to show them is the thing that only you have. I'm sure you've heard this before. Yes, but when you say it, I believe it. <laughs> so you are. You, there's only one you, right? You've got to find out what that is, or at least search for it in their presence. Because if you show them this thing that you are, that they cannot see anywhere else, if they want that, you've got the job. 
But if they don't want it, they're not going to forget you because they've never seen anything like you. And I'm guessing uh, over the years, one job leads to another, even yeah. if you don't necessarily book the job in the room. Um, absolutely. That's another thing people have to remember. You're, you're so right. You're doing this not only for right now, but for the future reference. They'll remember if you're a pain in the ass. Believe me. I mean, obviously a huge moment in your career was with 1984's Amadeus, in which you played Antonio Salieri. Um, I know Miloš Forman adapted the play for the big screen. Um, as director, I should, I should not short Peter Schaefer, <laughs> the writer. How familiar were you with the story and, and how did you go about landing the role in the film? Yeah, well, it was magic. It was one of those lucky, absolutely lucky things because he and Peter, Sch it's, it's pronounced Schaffer, by the way. Schaffer? Oh, my God, I've been saying it wrong all these years. Schaffer, two, double F. But he he uh, he worked with Schaffer for six months on that adaptation, by the way. They fought each other for six months to get it the way it is. Fought, worked together. But, um, but it, I, it was a wonderful adaptation. But as far as how I got it, uh, when they were auditioning people here in town for the, for the supporting actors, at that point in my career, I, I didn't want to be a supporting actor any longer. They wanted people to come in and do a, a improvisation as a group. And I didn't want to come in and, and try to audition for a supporting role to support some British actor. I hate to be taking off on the Brits. I really, I, I know there are some I love. I mean, Gary Oldman is just oh. wonderful, you know? And of course, Helen Mirren, with whom I've worked on, on Broadway, she's just a treat. I'll do anything for her. But my point is that it was written by a Brit for a Brit, and the Brits had great success with that role, Salieri. I mean, the man who created it got won the best, the biggest award. The, the guy who did it here got won the Tony. And I knew it was going to go to a Brit. But I insisted. I said, I just want to be, I don't want to see any, I'm not going to do any other role but that one. Wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> what the hell? So they said no. And then he invited me to be uh, in the improv group a second time. And I said, no, I really want to read for that. And I knew it was not going to happen. And then shortly after that, he did call and say, I want to see you for that. And we had an interview and he completely ignored me. Telephone was ringing constantly. It was about a five-minute interview. I was furious. I was trying to hide it. The producer was there too, and I kept looking at. It. I was like, "What? What are we? What's going on?" He's answering the phone. He's asking me a question, and then he then he takes a phone call. Anyway, after about five minutes, I, I said, "Okay, that's it, and goodbye. Nice to meet you." And I left. I was so mad, and I went to a friend's place and complained. And that's anyhow. The point is. A couple of days later, he called. He said he wants to uh, he wants to screen test me for the part. I couldn't believe it. You tell me what he possibly saw to do that, because to me it's a miracle. I mean, truly a miracle. And I did the thing. It was on tape, videotape. That's how far back it was. And before, I, by the time we finished the audition, I turned to uh, to go and thank him. And he was gone. He didn't even stick around to say congratulations or it was good or it was bad. He was gone. So I figured that's it. It's over. And in those days, when you did a, 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 it was a much nicer time. I always tried to get a look at what I had done, whether it was a commercial. And if they were nice enough, they would let you see it. And sometimes I even made a copy for myself and I had a little reel going. Yeah, they were very nice. And uh, the tape was gone. He grabbed the tape and left. So the point is that I thought it was finished. I went home and I was painting my kitchen. And he called a couple of days later and said, I want you to, for the part. I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, I still can't. And, I mean, uh, and then I said, what's next? And he said, well, you have to talk to the, to the writer. I thought, well, that blows that. Peter Schaffer, I mean, I admire him. He's a wonderful writer, but he's a, Brit, he's going to give it to a Brit. He should. I mean, of course. Well, he didn't. We got along. Zance liked me. And it changed my life. Wow. Did, did you ever ask Milos Forman, like, what he saw in you in a, those five minutes when he was answering the phone? No, because after a while, after I started working on the part, I realized he saw in me that I was a wonderful actor. <laughs> 
it's Literally. funny. I mean, who knows how, how these things happen, you know? I yeah. mean, it's, uh, it was just a, uh, no, I never asked him. I never questioned it. No. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, to this day, Amadeus remains one of the most highly regarded films ever. While you were making it, did you know you had something special? You can never, you can never let yourself think that way. You really can't. You want to believe it. I knew it was a great script, and I knew I was doing a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. But you can't let yourself think that far ahead. You really can't. I find myself even now when Academy Awards time comes around, I find myself making up acceptance speeches. I mean, doesn't everybody? What nonsense. I mean, <laughs> but you do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Of in the back of your mind, you want to believe it's going to make something, make a splash, but you stop yourself. You can't, you can't do that. If you do that, You've seen those self-conscious performances where people are saying, this is an Academy Award winner. It, well, it ain't, honey. <laughs> where there's scenes where you're like, this is my clip. This is my Oscars That's clip. It. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to me, again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but both you and Thomas Hulse, you know, are so active on stage. You, you haven't worked together since then, have you? No, he's a, he's a very successful producer now. Yeah. He ended up living across the street from me here in Manhattan. Really? Isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah, we've become friends. We weren't friends at, at, for a long time because that's the way uh, I wanted it to be when we were in Prague together. I lived separate from everyone else. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't deal with the company at all. I didn't think Salieri would do that. So I was alone for about six months. But that no big deal. It, was, it worked. It, it was the right thing. It was a distance between us that was necessary to maintain. And at the same time, we respected each other, which I think is pretty clear in the dictation scene at the end of the movie. Yeah. It's and also in your speech, you, you, you oh, gave well, him a lot of credit in your speech, which was lovely. Absolutely. absolutely. And I know obviously the film isn't a straightforward biography, but you've played real people several times in your career. I, I actually got to see you as Roy Cohn in Angels in America. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. It was another good performance, I must say. Not, not all my performances are wonderful, uh, by the way. But <laughs> you mentioned two that are. That, they were really good. I had a problem getting that one right because I disliked that prick so much. I disliked Roy Cohn. But boy, when it worked, there's another wonderful writer. I mean, Kushner. It's interesting also that I seem to play Jews very well. And you're and not Jewish. Syrian, yeah. Huh. I was raised an Orthodox Christian. But uh, I talked to David Mamet, one of his plays I did too, uh, several of his plays. And he's a very serious Jew, you know, David. And I wrote to him and I said, what is it about my affinity for Jews, David? And he wrote back and said, you are an honorary Jew. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm curious though, I actually was gonna ask if it was hard to play Roy Cohn because he is so despicable, but also when you have existing material to draw on, do you approach a role differently? Oh, yeah, you have to take advantage of that stuff when it's available. I had a very little bit of a part in uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Cohn Brothers film. That was, it was a wonderful, it's a half a day's work. Really? And uh, that's all it was. But it's a very memorable line in the movie, Lewin Davis. Lewin you know Davis. Lewin yeah. Davis. Yeah. But that, move, that line always gets a laugh. But I really studied that character. I worked on that man. He was a real man. I mean, he was a real bad ass producer, important producer. But really, that's a tough business, the music business. Mm -hmm. And I based him also on Saul Zantz, who was a tough producer of Amadeus and several other very good movies but he was the toughest of the tough in the toughest business, which is the music business, in case you don't know. And yes, you do take advantage of that stuff if you can. The problem is, if you, if you find out that they are such ugly people, it's hard to get past that because you really can't play someone that you simply don't like. You, you can't do that. It, it, it's, it won't live. You can, you can be acceptable in the performance. But the only reason I discovered it really was by accident. I was working on the script while I was flying to do a 
some work in Europe, when the guy sitting next to me saw the script, recognized me, and said, you're working on Roy Cohn, right? I said, yes, yeah, for Broadway, and I'm having a hell of a time with it because I just, I just don't like the prick at all, and I can't get past that. And he said, I did a trial against that guy. He was my opponent. And he said, I'll tell you something about him. I, I, he was one of the brightest attorneys I ever faced, and I detested him, but I couldn't keep my eyes off him. And I went, got it. There it is. Thank you. That's all it needed. I was that close. But if you don't get past that thing, whether it's Roy Cohn or whether it's whatever the reasons are when you're as an actor, you know when you're not there. Mm -hmm. You know when you're good, and you also know when you're bad. You know, especially if you're doing a play, because it's the first thing you think of in the morning. You got to live through the whole day knowing, I got to get up on the stage and be second rate. You know? Have you ever been bad, though? Like, oh. outright bad? <laughs> take my word for it, dear. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you got to be bad for a while before you get good uh, in some roles, if you're lucky enough for it, them to last. But uh, when I worked, uh, I was. I was hired at the last minute for to replace an actor in uh, who had a bad fall or something in uh, The Caretaker, Pinter. Mm -hmm. And I knew Pinter because he directed me in my first Broadway play. I mean, I knew him to say hello, but he always came to visit his shows when they were done. He was a very serious playmaker. And uh, I, I had to work on the accent, the Cockney accent. And anyhow, I had to go on stage not really knowing what I was doing. So for the first couple of weeks, I was just awful. I mean, I knew it was awful. And I, I kept thinking, maybe I'll have an accident. Maybe the theater will burn down. Maybe I'll have a heart attack. Anything but to do this play. And in fact, I became good. But you have to suffer. Mm -hmm. You can't quit. I mean, you know. And Pinter, fine, when he saw it, he said it was a wonderful performance. That was good enough for me. In general, how do you choose your roles? Is it the people involved, the story, the character, or sort of a case-by-case -case basis? That's funny. There was uh, that time when you just do anything that came along. Just give me some work, baby. I mean, you know, now it's different. They're just things I just, ever since the Academy Award, they're things I just don't want to do. Certain people I don't want to work with, so I don't. I mean, that's a good philosophy. Oh, well, yeah, if you can get away with it. You know, sometimes you got to, you know, you do what you got to do. I've done some stuff that I wasn't real proud of, but it did. Uh, I have to feed my family, man. I got to pay the rent. Uh, what draws you in most, though? Because, I mean, you've worked with so many amazing directors. You mentioned the Cohen brothers and Milos Forman um, just over the years. Wes Anderson, you've collaborated with several times. Fabulous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How do you become part of his, like, sort of theater company? Oh, uh, you got to have good luck. And I have good luck. But once you're part of his family, he's, he, he won't forget. Mm -hmm. this, this film he did before the one he's working on now, I was busy with uh, some, something. Uh, and he invited me to come to Paris to be in the film, if only for one day, just so that I could be part of the film. Wow. And I couldn't make it. I couldn't go. But he doesn't forget. But that's the kind of man he is. The Cohn brothers are that way too. They really are loyal. I've done a, quite a few of Ethan's plays, and uh, how how were his? Never mind. Never mind. He's a, he's a, we we get along well. What do oh, you this, like? This, oh. this show, Mythic Quest, by the way, yeah. has the same kind of feeling of family and atmosphere as Wes Anderson creates, and as the Cohn brothers insist on. Because it's more than just the work, which is always excellent, as you know. But also they care for each other. And they hire not only the people to, in the cast who are right and who like each other, but they cast the crew. Really? Also with that in mind. They make sure that they are good people as well as excellent at their work, but that have, uh, can, can fit into the family. This, uh, this mythic question is as close to the atmosphere of a play that I've ever been on. I actually really want to talk about your work in comedy because you're such a respected dramatic actor, but I remember 
so many hilarious performances. I'm, I'm obsessed with your appearance on Curb Your Enthusiasm, um, where you get to rap as the Ayatollah. <laughs> How did Mythic Quest come to you? Yeah, that's a mystery. But apparently the, the, uh, the Rob uh, must have seen that uh, no matter how heavy my characters are, there's always a twinkle. I thought, uh, I thought Salieri was pretty funny. I thought he was a real a funny character. But uh, it was, a, it was a, a little present from gods when he said, I'd like you to be in this, in this series. Because no one thinks of me for comedy. And I love it. I, I think it's nothing but I love to make people laugh. And my character in Mythic Quest is pretty funny. How did the Curb Your Enthusiasm appearance come about? And what was it like? Yeah, that's in? I don't know. Maybe someone knew that I was partly Arabic, partly Syrian, or that I could sing and dance. But uh, that is a show you got to, if you can possibly visit that set, you wouldn't believe how they can possibly turn out the stuff they turn out. Because there's no rehearsal, baby. You got a few bare lines, and then it's like, shoot the rehearsal. He's... There's another genius, I think. I hate to toss that word around, but how else do you account for him doing all that he does mm -hmm. successfully? But it's funny. You, you, you're with a bunch of people, and you don't know what's going to come out next. And you get up there, and you do it. And there's a guy with a camera right in your face. Okay, do it. And then he'll, he'll say, all right, so got it. Uh, let, keep this. Keep that. Throw that out. Do it again. Try this. Boom. I mean, shoot. Amazing. It was so fun, man, except for the dance stuff. That took a lot of rehearsal because I'm not a dancer. Yeah. Uh, and, and I really wanted to get it right, you know. Yeah. No, the, the musical within the episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm is really good. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'd like to see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's a good song. Pretty good people, too, in that show. Yeah. I mean, Mr. Miranda, Lynn Miranda. What a treat. We, we go back anyhow. Yeah, it's a good business when it's good. And when it's bad, it's rotten. It stinks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how do you sort of pull yourself out of the rotten times? Because it is a really hard business. And work. You, can go, you, you work. work. You work. Don't, you, don't, you don't sit around. You don't drink. You don't take a lot of drugs, man. I know. Oh, I, did, I did some of that shit. It, what doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. You work. You work out. Physical stuff. Get out of your head. Read, study, and have a good time. <laughs> let's, 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 let's not forget that part. I think some of us take ourselves far too seriously. I mean, thinking about having to do Curb Your Enthusiasm and suddenly ha having to improvise, it, it makes me wonder, are you still learning new things about acting even at this point in your career? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just learned something recently that it was really hard to take. It was a picture that I, I don't watch myself too often. I like, I, I, I watch little of some of it to see how it, how it turned out. That's all. But it's hard to watch my, you have to watch yourself to learn. And there was a movie I made some years ago that uh, with some pretty good people in it, but I knew the director was rotten. So I thought it was going to be a bad picture, and I was right. It failed. But only recently, it was remastered. And uh, they sent me a copy yesterday, as a matter of fact. And there was one particular scene in it that I was really proud of. And I looked for it, and I saw it, and it wasn't as good as I remembered. Really? Really. So, <laughs> I, so I frankly, I learned something from that, because some of the stuff in the flick that I didn't care too much about, was kind of pedestrian, was pretty good. And I'm trying to figure out now what that indicates. Hmm. I could have been just simply pushing, thinking this is gonna be a really good scene. This is gonna be memorable and great. Maybe that's what I was doing. So yes, I'm still learning. Still have, obviously have something to learn. I mean, give by the way, that's why you do the great roles. Yeah. That's why you try something complete. Like that's why you do Lear. That's why you do Richard III. That's why you do Othello. That's why you do those parts that you think are beyond you. How else are you going to find out who you are? 
I mean, how else are you going to test yourself if you don't test yourself about, against the greatest who ever lived? I feel that strongly. Uh, speaking about Shakespeare, because you just named three iconic Shakespeare roles, I know um, in 2005 you published A Midsummer's Night Dream, Actors on Shakespeare. It yeah. was sort of about your experience playing Bottom, yeah. um, which I think you have said is one of your favorite roles. Oh, absolutely. What that, is it about that part? Oh, gee. It's an actor's dream. That's one thing. He's an actor. He's like, like me. It's the kind of acting I like best. Have you seen Mark Rylance when he does something like Le The Bet? I mean, he was outrageous, but that's a bottom. That's what bottom would do, anything. But that reminds me also of some of the roles I've done for Terrence McNally. Uh, uh, have you seen The Ritz? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, I haven't seen you in it, but I've seen The Ritz. <laughs> there's a movie. And, um, that's right. Uh, yeah, with Richard Lester's directed it. But it's uh, that, that, that character I played is right out there. And he's just as wild and outrageous as in his own way uh, as uh, as Bottom was. I, it's, it's my favorite kind of work. Mm -hmm. It's why I like the opera. I like the size of it. And I, I'm hoping that when the theater comes back, and it will come back, uh, people don't misrepresent the theater for what it seems to be becoming, which is a stepping stone for a television or a movie production. Because if they do that, if they write a play with that in mind, the play shrinks to the size of a screen rather than expanding to the size of a Greek tragedy or to a Shakespearean gesture or to opera, an operatic size, something bigger than life. I, I'm, I'm hoping the theater will re-examine that. Are you anxious to get back on stage? I, I... <laughs> I can't wait. I, I can't wait. One, I did quite a bit of uh, Mythic Quest via Zoom. Oh, really? Yeah, I was kept out here while they worked out there for half the season uh, because I'm 81 and they kept thinking, we don't want to risk Mr. Abraham. He's an old guy. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm old, but I'm tough. Anyhow, uh, the, um, the, the thing I discovered when I was doing the Zoom acting with my, my colleagues that I really like so much. I think it comes across through the screen how much this company likes each other. I'm pretty sure it does. Oh, yeah. Do. But uh, what I discovered while I was doing it was that I physically need to get up in front of a bunch of people, physically have to be there. And I didn't know that it was that strong. It was that visceral. I knew I loved it, blah, 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 and I enjoy it but not that I longed for it because I was doing the acting, but not on stage. So yes, I miss it and I can't wait to get back. I've been offered a Broadway show now, just two days ago. Really? Yes, and it, we're going to, they're looking to do it late in the late fall, but it will tour first and we're coming to LA with it. Fantastic. Are you- no, sorry, please. It's not a comedy which we could use right now, but it's uh, it's heavy. It's, it's really heavy. Are you definitely doing it or something you're considering? It's something we're negotiating right now. Amazing. I, I would love to see you back in LA where it all began. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coronet Theater. Coronet Theater on La Cienega. Yeah, I love Coronet. That's where we opened. Wow. Oh my gosh. And it's still there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, one of the things that I love, but I also sort of dread about the experience of live theater is anything can happen. Yeah. Having been on stage for so many years, um, you know, have you ever forgotten your lines? Have things gone wrong? <laughs> with the How do you deal with it? <laughs> have I ever forgotten my lines? How many times have I before <laughs> opening night turned to my colleague and said, what, what's my first line? Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think that every actor has gotten through that. He, but that's not your job, your first line. You're supposed to be in the moment. Yeah, but what's my first fucking line? <laughs> I get to a point after uh, so many years, and it's happened a couple of times, I'm sorry to say, where I stop and I'll say, I'm lost. So you wait for the prompter. I, I'm, I'm not shy about that, but I, it doesn't happen often.
Mm-hmm. When it does, it's a terrible feeling. It's the actor's nightmare, not yeah. knowing your lines, you know. Give me a break, sure. But it happens. It's one of the reasons it's, uh, it's so thrilling. So mm-hmm. you improvise. Improvising Shakespeare, not easy. <laughs> yeah. Five foot meter, no, it's not, but it's fun. <laughs> well, and audiences will let you know in real time if they're enjoying what you're doing as well. That's another thing that intimidates me. That's another thing that excites me. Yeah. Yeah, it keeps you on your toes. I am able, when people, if someone has a very loud, loud sneeze in the audience, I instantly say, bless you. I mean, what the hell? You know, we can't ignore it. It's like ignoring a wolf walking along this. Anyhow, uh, other actors don't like me to do that, but that's too bad. What do you do if a cell phone goes off? Oh, that's another story. Gee. God, I've been on stage with some actors who really don't. It goes on, it rings, it rings. And one friend of mine doing a show a couple of years ago said, uh, you want to get that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Shoot. It I always saw, happens. Hmm? Oh, no, I saw something fairly recently where an Amber Alert kept going off. Oh, in the and it was a very like quiet, serious play. And the lead actor, uh, Neo Vardalos, actually like incorporated it pretty brilliantly into the script. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it makes me wonder, um, having played so many roles in so many different genres and so many different mediums, what has been your most challenging role? I think... As hard as Lear may have been, I think Macbeth was tough. Macbeth was tough. Yeah, Macbeth is not engineered as well as as Lear is because it's uh, it's unrelenting. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to do the play properly, I think you can't do no intermission. The whole the, it's about not sleeping. There's no sleep in this play, and it's got to go like a rocket. And it takes a great deal of energy. And I, I, there were some things in it that I did well, but I never really accomplished that role. There are things I did well in Lear, too. But I, I, didn't, I can't say I accomplished that role either. I, I'm not that vain to think I did. But I, it was interesting. Oh, by the way, for my Lear, uh, the second time I did it was here in town. And uh, I got the very best and the very worst reviews of my life. Same performance. Interesting, eh? Really? No, I choose to believe the best one, of course, you know. Of course. But that were they there on the same night, I wonder? I don't know, but I do know that uh, you like to say that you'd ignore them, but it's hard to ignore them. I, I live near where I was doing it, at, the, at downtown at the Public Theater. I don't live that far. So the day uh, that the reviews came out, the morning after opening night, uh, the phone doesn't ring when the reviews are not very good. And my phone was not ringing, baby. Really? So uh, on my way to work, walking to work, some stranger, like uh, he comes up and he says, did you read what so-and-so said about you? I said, no, I'm, I, I don't read the reviews for at least a couple of weeks. He said, boy, he really doesn't like you. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you. Now I got to go do the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, so what? That, I mean, you got to do the show. So you got to yeah. do the show. Do you ever find yourself reading criticism and agreeing with it? Well, I, I wait for a while after I do it a couple of times. But De Niro said that you can learn something from, the, from a critic. If they're any good, you know, if they're not just being nasty bums or, or ignorant. But I agree with him. You, you, you can... You can you can be instructed in many, many ways. And it's possible that a critic can help you out. I don't know how many good critics there are around now, frankly. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. the problem, you know? Uh, so I could say yes and no. I mean, you want to look at, read them for, to, to see a compliment. You know, you really do. You want to, you want to, but you want to be instructed as well. When I did uh, The Merchant of Venice, and I did it like I did it in uh, in rep with uh, the Jew of Malta, by the way. But when I did the Merchant, 
I got a, probably the best review of my life uh, for that performance from the same critic who said about my Lear, Abraham kills the king. <laughs> so, so, you see, he learned a lot between that time yeah. and this time, or, or I did. But the yeah. point is, uh, that review, when it came out, because we were going to take that on tour, it's the one you saw at the Broad yeah, yeah. in Santa Monica, where my wife went to school, by the way, before she went to UCLA. But anyhow, uh, when that review came out, my close friend, Julian Schlossberg, the producer, said, well, Murray, your tour is set. I said, what do you mean? I said, Murray, don't you realize this is the New York Times? Everybody in the country reads the New York Times. And we were sold out wow. for our entire run in every city we went to because of the New York Times. So, yeah, you do read them. They are very important, especially the New York Times. The flip side to that, though, is I remember Robin Williams talking about the Waiting for Godot that you did and how they were getting huge laughs and it was doing so well. And then the reviews came out and the audience stopped laughing. Well, they stopped laughing for a little while, but not all. Really? <laughs> yeah. After a while, they, yeah, he was, uh, he's one of the most, God rest his soul. He was one of the most wonderful men I ever knew. He was really a wonderful soul. Anyway, they, they really tore into that play. I did pretty well in it. So did Bill Irwin and uh, Lucas Haas, the young really? man who played. He was, he was marvelous. He was unintimidated by any of these. He's a, he's a remarkable actor, I think, Lucas. Uh, Bill Irwin's recent one-man show, he talks, he actually shows a clip from that play. Yeah. About it. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think it, it, is it Bill Irwin on Beckett? Or maybe it's just called On Beckett. Can I, can I see it? Is it on YouTube, do you think? I don't know. He did it out here in L.A. about two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. Damn it. I think he brings it back, though. He's always, you know, yeah. retooling and bringing stuff back. And He's, yeah. a, he's a good guy. A he's really amazing. good guy. Amazing. I'm so glad to say these nice things about people. I don't say <laughs> that. Honey, I don't say about everybody. I won't. No, <laughs> yeah. no. That company was nice. I mean, Steve Martin was terrific. We all got along so well. Mike was great. Everything was fine. Uh, it's just that the reviews were not very good. You know my Oscar appears in, in every play I've ever done. You know that, don't you? What? No. No. I knew it appeared in, like, like I didn't know that that was yours. How, how do you do that? I hide it. I don't let the audience see it. It's for the, it's for the actors to see. They discover it in every play I've ever done. And in Godot, he was buried up to his neck in the sand. You could just see his little head peeking. But, you, but on, on say, I give it to the stage managers and, uh, and they, uh, they hide it in trash cans, in drawers, and people, they hang it from the ceiling. And the wardrobe people make costumes for him. That is so cool. I had a little tutu. I did something called, uh, <laughs> someone made a gopher costume. Someone made a surfing bum outfit with a, I mean, the sunglasses and this. It was, uh, they love him. That's amazing. I mean, it, here and in Italy as well, when I worked there and in London, he always travels and he makes an appearance. He said, uh, my dear, he has made my life so much easier. It's been, every actor should win one. I mean, it's just wonderful. What a great idea too, rather than just keeping him on a shelf. That, yeah. that wants to perform. I, I owe him big time. <laughs> this wonderful house I'm living in right now. Lower Fifth Avenue. Are you kidding? I wouldn't be here if it were for the Oscar. You know, when you mentioned earlier that someone stopped you on the street and said, you know, have you seen the reviews? It makes <laughs> me wonder, uh, what do people want to talk to you about most? Is it Homeland? Because I know that that was, you know, such a fascinating character. Is it still Amadeus? I tell you, Homeland was a, was a real phenomenon mm -hmm. because it was worldwide, for one thing. And New York is a big tourist center. And I'd be walking outside my door. And this is a tourist area, by the way, where I live. And well, the whole city is actually. And people would say, oh, with these strange accents, da da da. Hey, hey. And, all, and it's, 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 a, it's astonishing how wide it is. But mm -hmm. uh, the people in New York, I think you'd be surprised how many people still 
can quote from Scarface. Yes. Which I made at the same time as Amadeus. You know that, right? Right, yeah. Simultaneously. Yeah, well, flying from Prague to Hollywood back and forth. It was, uh, and, and they came out about the same time. But uh, it's the people who like Scarface who would surprise you. Mm-hmm. They're not necessarily just working class people. There's people in suits, briefcases, quoting from it, loving it. And the other people like it. There's a there's a, a trash a, a, a guy who collects the trash on our street who loves Amadeus. Just every time we see each other, he stops to say hello and quotes a few lines. I mean, it's remarkable. Amazing, amazing film. Well, right now you're in like one of the top movies on Netflix, Things Seen and Heard. I don't know if you're getting a, a lot of reaction from that. People really Yeah, seem- isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. A couple of Brooklynites made that film. That was fun. Some good actors in that play. In that really movie. good actors, some really good performances. Yeah, it's true of Mythic Quest too. Some very good actors. Yeah. I've been very lucky. I continue to have good luck. I mean, is there anything you haven't played that you want to play, uh, any kind of a role? Do you want to do Lear again? Yeah, one more time. Got to be a cut-down version, though. But I want to do Lear, and I want to do, I want to do more comedy. There's a bit that I did from Ethan Cohn's play, It's Only an Evening, where I played the uh, Old Testament God. It's a, it's a two-and-a-half, three-page monologue, which is really hysterically funny that I do from time to time for fundraisers. It's pretty foul, but it's pretty wonderful, funny. And uh, I've been offered the chance the next time I come out to LA to do it as part of a stand-up at the Coronet Theater. Oh, wow. Yeah. So when I do it, uh, you'll come and see it. Uh, Absolutely. Were you going to do that before the pandemic? I was going to do it when I was out there doing, um, what was I working on? When I was working on... Oh, gosh. It's all running together. Well, old mind. Let's see. I was doing something out there for a while, and uh, I was invited to do some stand-up. Oh, I know what it was. It was the Larry David show. Oh, it was Curb. Okay. Yeah, Curb. (laughs) Yeah. And, oh, God, forgive me. What's the name of the character who plays, who's on that show, and he's also on... The Goldbergs. He oh, plays Jeff Garland. Jeff Garland runs that Monday night stand-up. He does. That's he invited wild. me to come and, and do it. And then something happened and I had to leave in the pandemic. But when I go out the next time, he promises that he's going to find a spot for me. I really love doing it. It's so much fun. I feel like I literally had it on my calendar a year ago for, for like late February or March, right before yeah, the shutdown. Yeah. That's why almost, it did it. almost did it. Next time. Well, I, I, I'll get to see it this year, hopefully. <laughs> well, again, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your experiences and your craft. It has been such a joy. Um, people can catch you now on Mythic Quest, on Apple TV Plus, yep. um, Netflix in the film. And, you know, hopefully we'll be seeing you in more and more comedies. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. <laughs>